This is FRM Part 2, Book 1, Market Risk Measurement and Management, and the chapter on Financial Correlation Model. It's actually a chapter on a bottom-up approach. And for those of you who have looked at the chapter, this was written by a dude named Meisner, um, you might notice that it's pretty short for what it tries to do. And in fact, I thought it was a little bit skeletal in describing the technical process of, you know, trying to figure out you know, some kind of uh, advanced correlation model so that we can make some reasonable conclusions about degrees of financial risk. So what I thought I would do at the beginning here is to give you an example that I worked up in my brain to give you a sense of what the following slides are going to look like so that we can concentrate more on, you know, maybe the big picture topics rather than the details of the mechanics because you'll see when we work through a mathematical example it'd be very very difficult to ask a question uh, for you to do some kind of technical research on, on an exam. Now those of you who watched my videos know that I like to give all sorts of uh, stories and analogies and so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the golfing world here to try to explain what we're doing in this chapter. Let's suppose that you and I are partners in a golf league and we play once a week during the summer for 10 weeks. And the way a golf league works is that we take the better of our two scores and that's the score for our team. So if I have a, if I shoot a four on a hole and you shoot a five, then we might, we mark down a four. And it doesn't really matter whether you shoot a five or a 10 or a 20, my, my four still goes. And so what happens in this competition is that the performance that we have together as a team depends on our co-relationship between our scores. It doesn't make it doesn't help us at all if we each have a par and a par and a birdie and a birdie and an eagle on let's say the first couple of holes and then we both have 20s and 30s on on those next holes so what matters is that when i have a good score it doesn't matter what you have and when, when i have a bad score it doesn't matter uh it doesn't matter uh it matters completely what you have so that we kind of offset each other we're, we're partners all right so let, let's work through this uh and have a little bit of patience with me because i think it's worth the time now, let's suppose you're the better golfer and you, you average 75 over that summer season. I'm the lesser of the golfers and I average an 85 over that season. And we have a 6-4 and four record against uh, our, our opponents and we qualify for the playoffs. So we're going to try to figure out how we can predict our performance in the playoffs. We played all summer long. Now the playoffs start. We took a two-week vacation, so we're going to start sometime in September. All right. Now we can easily calculate the correlation coefficient between our performance, right? I don't have to take you through the math, but we could take those 10 scores subtracted from the mean, take the other 10 scores subtracted from the mean and do all that stuff in order to compute the correlation. And let's just suppose that we come up with a correlation coefficient of 0.5. What that tends to mean is that, let me just take an extreme example, if you shoot 10 strokes over your average, your average was 75 and you shoot an 85, uh, what that means is that I'll probably shoot 20 shots above my average. I was 85, maybe I'll shoot 105. And so that doesn't do us any good. Now, don't tell your stats professors that I said that correlation works like that because it does it over time and there is, there is some changes there. But a correlation coefficient of five means that our performance is going to be in the same direction. So when you play well, I play well. And then we do it by a factor of either a half or two, depending on uh, which one occurs first. All right, so we have this correlation coefficient, right? It's 0.5 through our summer performance. Now we're into September, into the playoffs. Now we're going to see if that correlation coefficient holds for our performance in September. But notice that in September, the conditions of a golf course are probably a little bit different. You know, it's getting to the end of the summer, so it might be a little bit cooler. There might be leaves falling. The greens might be harder. They might be softer. Uh, the grass might be higher. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, sand traps might be uh, a little bit different consistency. So the conditions are going to be different. And then plus, our personal lives might be different. I might, I might be worried about my job. You might be worried about your children. So the question becomes, all that stuff that we did with correlations in previous chapters, 
is correlation stable? Does that 0.5 apply to what's going to happen in the performance of, of uh, our performance in the playoffs? And the answer is probably not. So we need kind of a more complete, a more complete measure of our performance as it applies to September. So this is what we're going to do. Now, we could probably try to determine the distribution of your golfing scores and my golfing scores. Now, over 10, those things might look like anything, right? So let's just say we might be able to determine them, but let's call them unknown, an unknown distribution. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your golf scores and my golf scores, and we're going to map them to a known distribution, like a normal distribution. And we're going to map. And those of you who looked at the chapter, you'll see that there is a, an illustration of the actual mapping from one graph to the other graph. So we map our 10 scores to a normal distribution, and then we can lay those two normal distributions on top of each other, because now we know everything there is to know about a normal distribution. And that mapping process then allows us to have a better prediction of what you and I are going to do as teammates in that September playoff. Now, of course, that's a really, really kind of a static example. What's an even better example, and we're going to work through one of these later on in the slide deck, is to try to determine the likelihood that two bonds that we own are going to default in the same year. Wow, that sounds an awful lot like risk management, but what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we don't really know <clears throat> what those distributions are for bond one and bond two. We may have an idea, but maybe they're unknown. What we're going to do is map those to a distribution that we know, and then we're going to be able to have a better sense of the riskiness of bond one and bond two and their co-riskiness, right? And, and Ultimately, we're going to be able to answer the question, what is the probability that those two bonds will default during the same year? So notice we're going to take unknown distributions. We're going to map them to a known distribution. All right, let's go ahead and look at the, uh, at the learning objectives here. You ready? Explain, describe, and summarize. So those don't sound like compute or calculate or demonstrate. So I'm going to provide you with an understanding of what's going on, and I'll relate it back to my golf example when we get to the bond example. And we're going to do this uh, through what's known as a copula function and a translation of the copula equation. And then we're going to focus on the Gaussian copula, which is the, uh, which is the normal distribution. And then I have an example about the default. So those are just the three learning objectives inside of this relatively short chapter. The first part of the slide deck is going to give, uh, give you some equations and some notation that may or may not seem uh, commonsensical, but once we work through the matrix at the end of the slide deck, I think it'll all, uh, I think it'll all come uh, full circle so that you can get a sense of what's going on here. All right, a copula multivariate distribution, which examines the association uh, or dependence between two variables or among many different variables. And we'll do the many variables in the last slide or two. And so the important thing here is to try to get away from our two-dimensional life. Remember, remember uh, in Back to the Future, Doc told Marty, you're not thinking fourth dimensionally. So here's this picture. If you look at it from the X, if you look at it from the Y, it looks like a regular old bell-shaped curve normal distribution. But when we do it in three dimensions, you have this surface that looks like a mountain. All right, and so what that surface is going to allow us to do is to examine the relationship between and among variables that are not subject to the, uh, the limitations that we face with just a regular old simple correlation coefficient. Now remember that correlation coefficient, uh, we rely on a, a, a normal distributions, but of course, what do we know? Well, I mean, we've talked about this many, many times that financial markets probably, probably don't uh, exhibit pro uh, the properties of a normal distribution. And if they do, it's more likely that it's over a relatively short time period or a relatively long time period. 
Uh, copula, Latin word meaning to fasten or fit. So remember what I was telling you earlier, we're going to take an unknown distribution and fasten or fit. Of course, we're just going to use the term mapping. So notice in uh, bold, I have, I have the word bridge. And so this is not a bad picture here. This is taken right out of, uh, out of the textbook. So we have, we have one distribution and we have another distribution. And then imagine sunlight shining from both the back of the red and the back of the blue, and then highlighting all of those observations in there. And so you get that joint distribution that is represented by the green oval. Notice I have two examples there, dependency between stocks, and then we're going to work through an example, dependency between defaults on bonds that have different ratings. All right, let me read this first one here. You guys know I don't like to really read my slides, but look, to create a correlation copula, two or more unknown distributions are mapped to a well-known distribution. All right, so that's exactly what I was talking about with my golf. Who knows what kind of distribution my golf scores are? I'm way up, I'm way down. Who knows what yours are, but you're a better golfer, so maybe yours are a little bit more focused in the middle. So maybe yours is a little bit less well-known than mine is. Uh, but what we do is we can fit them or map them to a well-known distribution. Boy, this allows us to make really, really good conclusions uh, about co-riskiness. And there's the notation for the copula function C, n-dimensional function uh, uh, based on the interval 0 and 1. And we know all about that 0, 1 going back to our introductory statistics days when we do standardized things with the mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. Now, the copula function can be defined like this. So we have marginal distributions there. Those are the Gs. And then the u's, uh, that's a mu, right? Mu 1 all the way up to n. So in our example, we're just going to have two, but you could have, I guess, hundreds if you really wanted to. And then technically then what we're going to do is look at that joint cumulative distribution function and the f raised to the minus 1. That's the inverse. I'll, I'll remind you what that is when we go through the table. And then notice all the way out, all the way out at the end, we have that uh, row sub f. And so that's going to be... That's going to be the correlation coefficient if this is just two variables, but it'll be it'll be a uh, correlation matrix if it's uh, if it's more than two variables. Now, of course, this goes back to this guy named Abe Sklar, who said something like that any any multivariate joint distribution, which is what we had that picture of just a few slides ago, can be written in terms of a univariate marginal distribution, you know, so pull, pull those marginal distributions, the multivariate joint distribution, pull them out and separate them and put a copula function over here so you can separate that multivariate joint distribution into kind of two parts. And, and there's a, a math equation for you to describe the notation. Now, the Gaussian copula maps that marginal distribution of each variable to a standard normal distribution. And so there we have the mean of 0 and the standard deviation of 1. And so the fascinating thing about this, of course, you guys know that that standard normal distribution, we know a lot about it, right? We learned it way back in when we were 20 years old in our undergraduate statistics days, and we rely on that thing for many, many elements of uh, our risk management strategies. All right, let's go ahead and just demonstrate here. Uh, two variables, v1 and v2, that have unknown distributions, right? So these are our two golf scores. They're unknown distributions, but they have unique marginal distributions. Now remember, the marginal distribution, if you put the table together, it's just, uh, it's just the, the sum of all those on the right-hand column. That's why we call it marginal, because it's, uh, those are the, uh, the uh, individual outcomes or probabilities that are in the margins. So V1 and V2 are mapped to new variables from that standard normal distribution. Let's just use the notation uh, U1 and U2. All right, so the mapping is done on a percentile to percentile basis to create this Gaussian 
copula. And so you, you think about my, my golf scores that may go, who knows what mine go, I do all that stuff. But what you do is you take like the first percentile and you map it down to the first percentile and the second percentile and you map it down to the second percentile. So the distance over here, the distance over here in my unknown golfing score distribution is going to be different than the distances over here in the standard normal distribution, of course. Okay. And so there is a picture of our two golf scores. I'm not sure if that's exactly right, but so what's happening, this gives you the sense that what you're doing is transforming, you're fitting those unknown distributions down to our regular perfect bell-shaped curve. Now look at that first block point. Uh, this is really interesting. It, it's very difficult to define a relationship between V1 and V2 since they're distribution, their marginal distributions are unknown and are pretty much incomprehensible structures. So I'm reading this in, in the chapter as I'm preparing my notes for this video and I'm thinking, okay, what's an incomprehensible structure? I mean, we can think of them in, uh, in terms of financial securities, but you know, we know lots and lots about the performance of a share of stock or a bond. An incomprehensible structure is my golf swing. And that's why I made the analogy of, all right, my golf swing, it doesn't look anything like somebody else's out there who's a good golfer. So we take that incomprehensible thing and we map it to something that's comprehensible. So look at the last uh, block point there. The Gaussian cop copula helps us define a correlation between and among variables when it is not possible to directly define a correlation. Oh, I love that. All right, if we're going to look for look at n variables, we're going to take that copula, the Gaussian copula function, and we're going to impose our correlation matrix over there on the far right. And the way we do this mathematically is by look inside of the brackets there, that n raised to the minus one. Uh, that's going to be the inverse of that standard normal distribution. And I'll, I'll explain that to you for those of you who uh, don't remember that here in just a second. Now, what we're going to do in our example is we're going to use this Gaussian copula to measure default risk. So we're just substituting some different notation in that formula there. And so here's, here's our example. Ready? Time one, two, three, four, five. So we've got two non-investment grade bonds, and they both mature in five years. One is rated BB+. Plus one is rated just BB. So notice, remember that, uh, that learning outcome. We want to examine default probabilities for bonds that have different ratings. So here we're just comparing BB plus and uh, BB. So it's really just the smallest difference in the slices of default risk. And so there are some default probabilities and we could have gotten those default probabilities from lots and lots of different places. A really cool place is just go to Bloomberg. Uh, the Bloomberg terminals have really cool default probability functions. All right, so the question is, how can a Gaussian copula be constructed to estimate the joint probability of default? There's that Q, right? I was telling you that we're just substituting substituting notation for our specific investment in these two bonds, uh, that these two bond issues in the next year, so sometime within the next year, assuming a one-year Gaussian default correlation of 0.4. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume this bivariate standard normal distribution because we have just two, uh, we just, we have just two bonds. So all we need is one correlation coefficient. All right, so what we're going to do on a table here, we've got, uh, we've got the time going down the left column, and then we have our default probability for asset one, and then we have the cumulative probability. So all we're doing is, is cumulating those. All we're doing is summing those down the column. And we do that over there for asset two as well. All right, so notice that after five years, we have about a 34% chance of default on the BB plus rated bond but a two-thirds probability of default on the just the regular old BB rated bond. 
All right, the important column here then is that, here, let me go back to this, uh, let me go back to here. The important column is the uh, n, n sub one, right, uh, raised to the minus one. So we're gonna take the inverse. That's the important column here. So let me just remind you of how this works. Let me go back to my golf scores. What did I average? I averaged an 85. You know, it might be interesting to say something like this. If I'm going into that playoff, I might say to myself on the first tee, what's the probability that I'm gonna shoot an 80? And so I can get out my Z table and I can do my standard deviation and I can look that number up on the table, right? And uh, that probability might be, that probability might be, let's say 16%. So I usually shoot 80, standard deviation might be five. I could say that's probably a 16%, but let's look at it from the inverse. And this is what we're trying to do here. Let's suppose that uh, when we get on the first tee, the, the people that we're playing against looks at me and they say, hey, Jim, I looked in my crystal ball and I know that you have a 20% chance of shooting this score that you're gonna shoot today. What is that score? So we have that 20%, now we need to find out the score and that's what the inverse does. And so notice I have in that bottom block point down there, uh, you can do this manually. Uh, uh, but why don't we just uh, whip out our Excel or our, uh, our MATLAB and do it for us. All right, so those columns there are inverses of the, you know, the bell-shaped curve and that area under the curve in which we're given the probability and then we're trying to figure out what that, uh, what my golf score was. Now, in this example, we don't have this correlation structure we just have a single correlation coefficient and that was uh and that was 0.4 so here's the answer to the question ready the joint probability of both company b and company c defaulting within one year is calculated as and what we're trying to do so there's notice at the bottom there's the minus 1.41 .4, uh, i'm sorry 1.51 and there's the 0.7123 so those were the inverses during that first year and essentially what you're doing is your joint probabilitying them right you're laying that remember that first slide i had on there one of those first slides i had the marginal distribution here marginal distribution here and all that stuff in the middle we're trying to find the union uh, we're trying to find the mix of those things where they both occur right what is the probability that b and uh company B and C will default within one year. And there it turns out to be 3.4%. I wouldn't worry too much about calculating that thing. Of course, Excel gives it to you. Now, how about if we extend this into multiple assets? Uh, it's not really a good example in my golf course, but of, with when we're doing the example with the bonds, suppose we have a third bond and a fourth bond Oh, wait a minute, I just had a thought. Suppose we are investing in a credit default swap that is based on a basket of bonds in which the credit default swap pays off on the first to default or the third to default or the uh, 12th to default, or it doesn't pay off until all of them default. You see how all these layers in the derivative market um, lend themselves for the use of this copula stuff. And so the interesting part about all this notation here is that we need a correlation matrix. And so just a quick example here, if we if we draw a 30% cumulative default probability for asset I, right, then we need to look at that default correlation matrix, which is going to give us the de default correlation between and among all of those bonds inside of our portfolio. And then we can work our way back to, notice I have a time equals three. I guess I didn't go over all those uh, terminology here, but there's that uh, little tau for time. And so that is, uh, we find that our estimate, uh, estimate of default time tau, um, in this case, it was three 30% coincidence. And we do this, you know, boy, 100,000 times. Boy, that sounds an awful lot like Monte Carlo simulation that we've talked about before. And so just remember that if we're doing this for a portfolio of bonds or a portfolio of some kind of derivatives, that what we need to do is have 
we need to have that correlation matrix and we need to compare and contrast and make sure we have the relationship down between and among all of our bonds. And so here's the question, are these financial instruments co-related? And uh, the answer is, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. But note, default time in years, this is upward sloping. Of course, this is, uh, this is going to be upward sloping. Ah, what did I say? Look at the middle block point there. Copulas are popular tools to model credit default swaps, also with collateralized debt obligations. And so you've got these bonds. Remember, when uh, an issuer borrows money in the bond market, they're making an explicit promise. I promise to pay interest. I promise to pay principal. And of course, it's a much more complex process that rather than just you know making the coupon payment and making the principal payment. And so what this uh, Gaussian copula model does for us is it allows us to price this risk so much better than just simple correlation. And that sounds like a pretty good concluding statement there. And so that takes us through those learning objectives.